Okay, thank you for joining us today. We are going to talk about how to write an NT shellcode. Um, we will start by explaining what the shellcode is in general and <laughs> <laughs> and um, we will show you the C code that started it and how you convert it to some assembly language code that directly calls the system calls and um, then we will show what kind of things you have to do to your code so you can use it as shell code. Can someone please remove that dog? <laughs> Has, don't, doesn't have to be permanent, so just someone go there. Um, and we are not going to show a very sophisticated shell code, just some simple code that writes to some file. The background is that normally shellcode doesn't have to be destructive. On Unix, it is very simple to make a small piece of code that will actually open a shell for you. And um, then you have complete access to the machine over the network connection. But on NT, um, things are a little more difficult. You have to have a special DLL, WinSock DLL, to make socket calls at all. And um, piping is not so straightforward. Making system calls under NT is not so straightforward. So um, the general methods apply, though. So what we show today um, can be used to make more elaborate shellcode. And that has been done. But it's um, quite long shellcode that actually does open TCP connections or pipes programs. So if you want that, you can find working code on the network. We'll just show you what you have to, what kind of transformations you have to do to get working shell code. The example we will be using is the I exploit that was on the net, I think a month ago, about the internet information server on NT where you could use .htr files um, and use override a buffer in the, the name of the file. So that was the actual buffer overflow we exploited. And it was sufficient to show that you could run code. We didn't have to open a shell. So it was not the goal was not to um, actually get a shell on the machine, but just to show the client that you could run code on the machine. And we will be trying to use that Beamer to yes, show the, the slides. By the way, I'm Felix, and this is Ötzkür, and he will be using the slides to talk to you now. OK. I'll give some introduction into, um, well, the question is, what is a buffer overflow, and what is the exploit of it? And for this, we, we make an example, a short, small example under Linux, not NT because most of the things apply to um, almost all operating systems. The concept is the same. So I show you something. We have this little piece of code. When I find it. Actually, we will be using Intel syntax for assembly language on, um, on our examples. So. You can use it under Linux with nASM, but you don't have to. So th we use this because um, when I wrote the code, I used my knowledge from MS-DOS days. So you can probably see from the code. Can Actually, this is, this is the kind of function that um, can be exploited with buffer overflows. Uh, I hope you can read it. It's, it's a small piece of C code. Um, Just better? Is it better? Okay. OK, we have a small piece of C code. There's nothing more than one buffer. It's called S. This line. And you can see we are copying the value of the environment variable foo into this static buffer. And the question is, what happens? What is going on there? We might expect that when the value of foo is small, something like one character or 1,000 characters, 
um, there won't happen anything uh, we wouldn't expect. It will be copied into this buffer S. But now, I am prepared. I compiled it already. So when um, I already set up the variable foo, oh, I didn't. <laughs> Let's try. Okay. Now, nothing happens. You might, maybe you see what happened. Now we have this, which is quite long. I wrote 103 times the string 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 into this variable foo. So it's bigger than the buffer. Now it's bigger than the buffer s. And so we have something, maybe some of us see such a line um, many times a day. <laughs> okay, so we start to, to understand what is going on, actually. What is the segmentation fault here? For this, I, I have prepared a output of the compiler, assembler output of the compiler, not the compilation in binary form, but I use GCC, GCC, oops, what's that? Anyway, we have here a prepared version of it. So this is an assembly, and the important part is uh, here. This is the main function, the function where the program actually starts to be executed, and those three lines are called, it's, it's standard code written in almost every program uh, from the compiler. It's called, um, uh, how do you say? setting up a stack frame. So actually what happens is that on the on the stack we you see the first line we put the base pointer onto the stack to mark where our code will begin. The third line which is the the most important line there is an allocation of space on the stack for our variable s the the buffer yeah so what we can what we can see now is we have imagination how the stack is looking like. Well, some of the words maybe are not so familiar to m some of you. Um, you need well, I will not explain what the stack is actually. Do you want to explain? Okay. Um, we don't want to scare you away, but this is going to be mostly assembly language the examples we will be showing you. So, if you haven't seen this before, this is full of legacy. The whole Intel architecture is full of legacy anyway, so. Oh, I'm not the first in this room. The stack is a quite old concept of computers. Um, what happens is that the memory physically is just a large block that can be addressed at any point. And if you load a program into memory, the code is loaded and some location that is dynamic on some systems, that's static on others. Anyway, this is static code from the file, the program file. 
Then you have some Then you have some data that can be dynamically allocated by the program itself. And you have another type of memory that can be allocated dynamically by the program. The idea is that you don't write the whole program in one piece, but you write procedures. So you separate the different um, ideas in the program in procedures, and when you call a procedure, the procedure has to know where to jump back. It has to know who called the procedure so it can continue execution when it's done at the point where, from where you called it. So we have to record the location from, where we, from which we were called at some point, and we do this on the stack. You this can organization. See it also, hmm? Sorry, you can see it on the picture. This is where return address is. The, the whole um, uh, rectangle there is, is the stack for the current program. And on the bottom, you see the, um, the pointer to the environment variables, the pointer to the arguments, um, the integer which says how many arguments we have, and then the return address. This is on the stack. Then we have this, you saw it in the, here, it's uh, the piece of assembly code starts there. We push the, the data which was in the base pointer before, this is above of the return address, and then we allocate space for the buffer S we had in the um, C code. Uh, maybe I should show you the name. So we need um, a location to remember from where we were called, and this location is not known inside the procedure. So if we call some piece of other code, which might actually be part of the system library or the operating system itself. What we do is first, we push the address where we want the procedure to continue when it's done on the stack. Then we call the procedure, and the procedure, when it's done, gets this value from the stack and returns there, jumps there. So what happens if, if this procedure calls another procedure, it has to be put on the stack again, so the, the address is not static. Pushing something on the stack means writing it here, for example, and then incrementing the stack pointer to the next address. So the, the operation that can be done on a stack is just pushing values on it and then removing the values again. When a procedure needs more memory than what you passed it, dynamic memory that will, be, will no longer be needed when the procedure is done, you can put that on the stack too, as was hap as happened to the, the buffer Ötzküher used in this example. So you don't have to put the data on the stack in just bytes or words, but you can also allocate larger amounts of stack, like this buffer. The stack grows upwards. That means if you put data on the stack, behind that data is the address where the procedure wants to continue execution when it's done. So when we use a local variable like the buffer that's used in the example, and you write something there that's longer than the space that was allocated for it, you overwrite this value, the return address. Okay, we show it in this example, what he explained. So, you saw, maybe... Actually, this is not always the case that the stack grows upwards. There are some historical examples for architectures where the stack grows downwards, and... Um, all recent architectures do grow this way. So this is not only Intel machines, but also most other machines. But it is not, you don't have to do it like this. And of course, if the stack grows in the other direction, it's much more difficult to override the return address. Okay, let's take a look on it. Uh, the code 
makes just a simple copy of the environment variable foo into the buffer s. And that means in this the stack case, the copying will start at minus 1024, looking from the base pointer. And there will the the um, the value of foo will start copying there and moving down there. And if it's too large, you will override the the base pointer and the return address. And this is something we are going to look through um, some some glasses. It's called the debugger. Actually, one important thing to notice on this point is that after you override this return address, it's gone. This is the reason why exploiting a buffer overflow most of the time means that the program you're exploiting is ending then because you don't know where to continue. And this means in the ISS case we will be showing later that the the process will either um, crash by itself or we will end it the natural way. This which leaves less traces. So this is what's happening most of the time in exploits. Let's take a look. I I put a breakpoint in in the main function so we can see actually what addresses are used. As you can see, the stack frame, the stack frame here uh, doesn't has any um, absolute addresses there. You can't see them. We know just know relative structure of the stack. We don't know the um, actual location in memory. So now we see some address there. So the main function starts at the address 0, um, 80, 48, 53, 9. So we are at the main function now, and we take a look at the disassembly. We don't expect any difference to what we had before in the assembly, it's just now we will have the addresses too. You see here, maybe you can, you remember those three lines. Those are the lines for the stack frame. And this is the, um, the buffer size we used for our variable. So we saw already what happens when we use our variable foo, which was uh, 1,030 bytes long. And we just want to know what happens at this point, return. As Felix said, um, when we overwrite the return address here, which was set from the function, the calling function of our function, uh, we are maybe ending somewhere, who knows? Let's take a look. Actually, this is the point where the program crashes most of the time because the, the addressable memory is much larger than the actual memory in most machines. So um, even if you have much memory, the program will usually be allocated just a few kilobytes, maybe megabytes. But if you jump to a random address somewhere, it will probably not be map memory, and the operating system will notice. OK, I said I set a breakpoint at the return where the return happens. And now we continue till there. And we want to see what the next step is. As you can see, there is some well, maybe you can't read it, but uh, the debugger tries to tell me that there's something strange. There's a there's a um, address pointing to the unknown function for the debugger. And if I just continue, what happens is that um, the 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 return address will be used. The um, the code at that position, whatever was available on the return address um, on the stack whatever there was, uh, this will be called. And maybe you can see, uh, 
those four bytes, those are digits, yeah. Um, those are the ASCII version of nine and eight, which is a part of our variable foo. So we overwrote the, the return address with the part of our variable. So the question, the natural question is now, can we put something into the variable foo on a special position where we don't have this garbage here because there's no function at that position. That's why we have a segmentation fault here. But um, the function we can choose freely, something like, I don't know, maybe write. And this is uh, how exploit works, actually. The usage of a special, uh, you create a special string, for example, in the variable foo, where at the special position you put the address where you definitely know there is a function available I want to use now. So in, instead of returning, we will jump from here directly to the function of your choice. Um, this means, one, once, one thing you should have noticed that we overwrote the later part of the number. The, this is actually surprising because one would think that machines store numbers as you write them on paper, storing them the highest digits first in memory. But this is not the case on Intel machines, and most modern CPUs actually can switch this, so you can tell the CPU, the operating system can tell the CPU which mode to use. Actually, Big Endian is uh, much of the norm on different Unix systems, but on Intel CPUs you cannot switch this. So MS-DOS and Windows can only use the little engine mode, which is default on Intel. Most other architectures and operating systems use big engine, PowerPC, MIPS, most of the other things use this. Actually, Alpha is a case where it depends on the operating system which mode is used. Linux on Alpha is quite an odd old port of Linux, so they decided to emulate the Intel ways and use Little Indian. But now Linux is moved, has moved farther than that and can actually run both ways, but it's still using Little Indian. So the only CPUs you will ever meet probably that use Little Indian mode in memory are those two. And that means if we overwrite the first byte in memory of the address, we actually overwrite from the written form, the last bytes. And you might have noticed the zero, two zeros here, at this point, which is the marker of end of string in C. So what we actually exploit here is not a lazy programmer, but a C function of the standard C library that is written in a way, defined in a way that is um, not easy to use in a way to limit such exploits because you can tell this function how much space you have reserved. So there will always be a way, unless you check manually beforehand, to write more data than you have allocated. Okay, this example, uh, we won't go much further here. We, want, we don't want to write the shellcode um, exploit for Linux, not for this program, but I guess maybe you have the idea what is going on there, what the buffer overflow actually is and how to exploit it. Um, we now switch to the, to the more important stuff, the NT-exploit. Um, It doesn't matter. There are a few typos here, and it's not um, just 10 minutes old. So, what you will need is um, a computer and the software, which is known to be broken to have a buffer overflow. You need those both parts to test something. Um, and you need some tools. Oh, I forgot the, the compiler. 
maybe you need the compiler too. You need a debugger, as in our case, because you have to um, check out the stack, the registers of the CPU. Those are important uh, informations for you. Those are the, the, the essential informations for you. And you need a uh, macro assembler. Sorry. OK, some other uh, aspects are you need the header files of your operating system. In, in our case, it's the uh, NT API for calling, for example, how to write the file on disk, something like that. You need uh, the information, what parameters are expected by this function. Um, well, and the last point is you need some skills. This is some knowledge in assembly programming and, well, a, a base knowledge of uh, how, uh, how the CPU works, how your architecture works, how many registers are there, what are they used for. And this is basic knowledge. Uh, you, can, you can learn it by yourself. I guess it's, it depends on you, maybe between five minutes and 20 days, something there. The average is three. We actually, um, <clears throat> we actually suggest that you use Linux for testing buffer overflows um, because on NT many um, system calls are not checking their parameters properly so you might actually crash the whole system by accident. So you should use Linux and um, these, the software we, we list here, actually this is a typo, soft ice is written like the, the ice cream. Um, ah. Some individual uploaded it on our FTP server in case you needed this commercial software. So if you really use it, you should, of course, buy it. You can also use the, for example, under, under Windows NT, you can use the um, Microsoft C++ debugger, which comes with Microsoft. This is, should be sufficient for most cases. It's not that comfortable like soft eyes, but uh, sufficient. So how should we go about on getting code to put in this buffer if we write a small program like Hello World and compile it with the Microsoft C++ compiler. We get a binary that's much larger than the buffer we're trying to overflow. So we need to get small code and programs that you compile with standard compilers um, normally use the standard library of that compiler, which is normally a few hundred kilobytes large, which is probably also linked in the program that you are exploiting. But um, you can't be sure if someone is using some obscure language or if um, the, the different version of the C library is used on the machine that you are trying to exploit. And so uh, we need to get code that is both small and not using any libraries that may not be on the system or may be in a different language, different version, whatever. Okay. Um, the example now is um, about the IS, IIS bug, which was uh, found by I. I don't know how they are called. EI. EI. Okay, EI. Uh, a month ago, which was almost like this, I explained it on the board. If you used your favorite um, browser, well, actually, your browser wouldn't, cannot handle those addresses. But um, what happened was, um, if you connect to the ISS and send in uh, URL, which is quite long and has the uh, HDR ending, um, ISS would immediately for it uh, well there are some conditions it's it must be version 4 under an english system we we couldn't um, make it work on on german systems that doesn't mean the exploit doesn't work on german systems but the system libraries are in a different language that means some error messages may be longer 
taking more or less space. That means the code that comes behind those messages moves a little. And as we will show on NT, it's quite difficult to do system calls because what you do is actually jump in the kernel and you get the offset because the program, the system component that loads program patches those offsets for you. So under more sane systems like Linux, you do a system interrupt. That means you have a global table of system routines, addresses, so the program can actually have position independent code. The code works wherever the code is mapped, which is actually what you want because loading a program does not need the overhead then to patch up those offsets. So under NT, what you do is you write an offset in your file. You just do a jump or a call into operating system space. And the linker then does not really fix up those offsets, but leaves a list of offsets that still have to be patched when the program is loaded at load time. And the operating system then puts these offsets there, which of course leaves the problem that our exploit code needs those offsets too if you want to make system calls. And a system call is something like open a file, write data into a file, run an external program, stuff like that. So everything that actually does something needs to run system calls. That's why we would tell you it's easier to learn how to make buffer overflows work under Linux because you, you don't have that kind of crap on your hands then. Okay, maybe this was a bit too fast. We make it step by step. First, uh, the, the first thing you need is some kind of orientation. What do you have? So what you try is you make an, um, you create a buffer overflow with the program um, and maybe use a nice pattern to recognize. As you remember, uh, we use the debugger to watch what our code makes actually with the data we send. So he closed the program. Um, <coughs> we do it on the on the screen. What is up there? <laughs> yeah. Just a second. Whoops. Mm, not really. Uh, anyway. This sucks. We need a pointer. So the problem is we don't actually know at this point if there are any variables besides that buffer on the stack. And if the calling convention actually does this, most compilers have an optimization that you can enable that leaves the stack pointer out so it doesn't save this register on the stack. So what we don't really know is how much more data after the buffer we have to override to get this address. And because we don't know on which which address the stack is and on which part of the stack we are, we don't know the offset that we have to write here to get to our code. So um, to get our code to the system, it, there's only one position where the code can actually be. This is inside this buffer. So um, we want what the, the idea of the exploit would be to write into this position an address in this part where our code begins that we uploaded and then um, the procedure would return, would get the wrong value and execute the code we wrote there. Just to make another picture about what Phoenix said, if this is the position where uh, the stack pointer is, well, this is a special case for the other example. We had um, the knowledge about the program because we wrote it, we know we already know how big the, the, the buffer will be. But in general, for example, in the IIS exploit, we don't have such information. So we need the information, for example, you know here, this is 1024 bytes, but in general, how far are we away from the stack pointer? How much code we have to put in to override the stack pointer? So we need a technique to find out, let us say our, our code will be start here and 
move down, we need this distance. And how do we get this information? And there's a quite easy technique um, to, to get the information. You write a special pattern as your overflow code. Just a special, you remember the 0, 1, 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 in the previous example. And you could see which digits will be left on the, um, on, uh, at the return address on the stack. Actually, you could see. But this is not uh, enough information because the, they were um, the, the blocks 0, 1, 2, and so on are, um, are repeating. So we don't know which block it is. The, the idea is to take a, to, I just show one pattern. How many of you are reading bug track mailing list? Just statistics, okay, most of you. So if you have seen buffer overflow, it's in the last month or so, people are, are not actually posting exploit code, but they put lots of A's in the buffer. And the reason for this is that when the program crashes and you have a debugger loaded on your system, or you get a, the core dump and you can examine it under Linux or Unix with your favorite debugger, you get a register dump. So you see when the program crashed, what data was on the registers. And this is important because that the program crashes does not mean that you actually overwrote a buffer. It could be some other bug. Or it could be that you overwrote um, not some values on the stack, but it's on the heap. And the program crashed because it, because some some other problems. So this is done because if you see in the register dump that one register has lots of A's in it, which is 4141414141, then you know that this register was loaded from the memory you overwrote. So that's why you use lots of A's. You could lose lots of other patterns too, but this has become the standard now. So if you post, if you find a buffer overflow, do it with A's too. Yeah, the, the A's are important to give you the information. You are on the right way. You can make an overflow there, most probably. The, the other one is, uh, I have a small program which generates a, a nice patterns. Just give it a number. Um, well, maybe we take some more. Then you will see the patterns better. For those who are interested in what, well, maybe you see some structure there. That's the way how the patterns are generated. You start with the small <laughs> Z, just that, that's the code. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the, the only important information is this pattern, with this pattern, if you try to uh, make an overflow with it, you will have immediately the information where in your pattern um, your overwriting process uh, occurred. You can oh, point one, one more information you need. Um, I told you that you can put more than one word on the stack. Uh, there's one more thing. Most CPUs are more efficient if you align your data, and most RISC CPUs only allow access to aligned data. That means you can um, you can only access data that are on a D word boundary. That is the the offset is dividable by by four or the word length. Um, and that means that if we pop a value on the stack, we always, if we push a value on the stack, we always push at least four bytes. On Intel on, and on Alpha, you, of course, eight bytes. So what we need here is a pattern that allows us to see which offset we need, which part of the, the overwritten memory actually is the return address. So the idea is to just put different words on the stack. We overwrite this with a regular pattern that allows us, if we examine the core dump or the debugger register dump, we can see which value was returned to. And then you can simply calculate which value it was. It was in your generated pattern. This, this is just an example, which is easy to see because We immediately know it must be it must be this one. Yes, and now we we have the distance from the beginning to the well. In that case, from from the opposite. Okay, so we have information where in memory we are, the offset. 
Okay, and then we know how much code we actually can create. That's in the other information. So, oh, actually, this pattern has some other nice property that you want because because it's a web browser. Not all characters are legal. So you can, for example, put, put zero bytes in a URL. So this pattern is only normal characters. That means most buffer overflows will not alter that pattern. We, when, when creating code, we will see why this is important. But in this case, you need a pattern that, for example, does not contain zeros. Uh, well, this is a bit nonsense there. But the important stuff was said by Felix. Um, you may see in that. Well, you tried, you found the overflow. You take a nice pattern and you see um, where you are in memory. So the next step is um, to make more out, out of this information. And as he said, there may be some other constraints, like in the ISS, you are not allowed to send dots because in the URL, you remember, If you would use a dot, well, here, those are 1,024 characters. And if you would have a dot in between, then the ISS would recognize the rest of it, of it as an uh, ending and would not overflow anymore because he needs the HDR there. Yeah? So that means you have some constraints. You have, your code must fulfill some requirements. So because it's easier to see how to get something done in Linux, we will use that example. There's not only code that is loaded from disk, but there are some other static data, like example, for example, the command line arguments are somewhere in the memory range too, because you can read them and the environment variables. So something you can quite easily guess is the position of the environment variables that are there because when the program is loaded and you didn't change the environment, you have the same environment that the other program will see. So what you can do is calculate, you put something in an environment, an environment variable and you can see the position relative to the starting of the program and then you can guess where this, this same environment variable will be for the other program. And this will, of course, still depend on the environment and whatever, but to get something done, you have a, an address that you can guess that is most likely static and the same on the other program. So as I told you, um, you have to patch that ad return address and you don't know where you are. but. There's some other space where you could have put code. So one, one trick that is most often done when you are experimenting with buffer overflows in the beginning is that you actually put a value in the environment that contains code. And then you calculate the address of this and override the return address with that value. And then you have given the program code to execute. And um, with some tricks, then you can find out which part of the program you overflowed. And actually, there have been um, buffer overflows, not over the network, but local. On Solaris, for example, there's one example that I can recall now where this would actually suffer because you overwrote some code that used the environment and you could get both flies with one clap. So this is one way to get the code there. But you, on the other hand, if we can put any value here, we don't need arbitrary code at the, the other side. It's sufficient to have code that will jump back to where it came from. And the fun part is that when the buffer is overwritten, you normally use registers of the CPU to point to the addresses that you're copying. 
So one of the registers on Intel, it's mostly the EDI register contains a pointer that is in the vicinity of the code that you just overwrote. So you need not arbitrary code where you can jump to, but code that will use this register and jump there. This doesn't mean that you have to put that code somewhere, but you have to find some place in some system library where there is some code that actually does this, that uses this register and jumps there. And um, this is just the way that it's been used on NT. We'll come to that later. Oh, there are other tricks, by the way. You don't have to know exactly where you want to go to. To give you an idea of how big a shell code is in the end, the one that we have been writing here was something like 130 bytes. So you have lots of spare space. What you can also do is just guess where the code will be. And you have all the time of your life to test it if it's a local program. So you can just run the program and guess 15 as address. And then you just increment the address you are trying by the size of the buffer. And eventually, it will return to some place in the buffer. And you can, of course, write code that does nothing. So what you do is actually you fill the buffer with lots of code that does nothing. And in the end, there's your shell code. Then you don't have to try all the possible values. But you have just to come near. So it speeds things up greatly. So we now assume that we have a way to jump in the shell code. But that's not all. We can place arbitrary code there. Um, depending on the, the program we are exploiting, we have additional constraints. The most common constraint is no zero bytes, because the most commonly exploited functions are string functions from C language. And then you just have to write code that doesn't contain zeros. This is a layer below what most programmers ever see. So the most close to the machine people come usually is to see the assembler dump. But you don't know if the code you wrote contains zeros or not. And this is even more a problem if you use relative addressing. In our example, we are going to write to a file. So we have to have the file name in memory. And it's just part of the shell code. So one second. So what we do is we try to calculate our position. We try to find out our position. We will show you the trick we used to do that in a few minutes. And then you have to do relative addressing. So you have to add the offset of the starting of your code to the message that contains the file name. This is a simple calculation, but on most machines, you can't add just one byte values, but you can only add longer values. And longer values means that it's padded with zeros in the beginning, and you can't use zeros, so you have lots of tricks. And that is the part that makes shellcode writing um, a little tricky. It's not actually difficult. We hope you will get the impression later. Um, did you have a question? Or were you just yawning? <laughs> no OK. What we have now is, just to recollect everything, um, we have some information about the memory layout. We know um, something about where we will be with our code in memory. And now we start to think about what kind of code we want to. Um. One question? Because you put the code there, you know it's the code you uploaded. You give you overwrite a large buffer, and you know that this distance isn't the same because you give you upload all the bytes in between two. So um, if you upload ten bytes, you know that the distance before, between the first and the last one is ten. So yep. if you upload two kilobytes, you know that the distances in between are constant, no no matter where your code actually starts. Yeah, the so point is maybe just to make the, the Maybe the question was, the whole picture there may be changed in memory by every time you run. You know, you run the program and then you have a starting point for the, um, for the return address is somewhere and the next time it's somewhere different. But relative in your program, all the buffers you use are always the same. Relative to yeah, the, the memory layout for your program is the same if you use static buffers. 
actually most compilers nowadays allow you to create position independent code because if you have a shared library, most of you have seen this probably, shared li library, you, you want to load the code into memory and don't want to fiddle with it. If you don't have position independent code, you have to add, go through the code, find all the pointers to some other place in the same code and add the starting address of where you loaded the memory, the, um, the library in memory. So this is obviously not something you want to do. And most CPUs allow you to do position independent code, um, but it's not something that you can learn from reading assembly language books normally. So the idea is to write code that works no matter where it is loaded. And initially, the first step is to find out where the starting part is. Highly secure password security here. Okay, I have to move the mouse a bit. <laughs> okay, so um, um, <coughs> maybe just to complete this this one, um, it may be that the the offset you have recognized, the amount of space that is available for your shell code, maybe only twenty bytes. So you won't start to write an exploit uh, which starts, uh, for example, a email uh, session or something like that because you don't have enough memory to write it. Um, so the, the choice of code depends, for example, the of, uh, for, um, um, depends on the amount of space which is available. It also depends about your knowledge of the system. For example, do you have uh, do you you want to write a file. Do you know how to write a file on that system? This information can be made available, for example, if you simply write a program on that system, uh, just a usual program which writes a file, and you debug it, and you get out um, the information about the offsets of those functions which are called. Yeah, you just write a piece, um, uh, you create all the structures maybe you need, all the parameters you need for the for the function, and you simply call the function in, in the favorite C compiler. For example, under NT, use the Microsoft C++ compiler, the environment, write three lines of code, writing some file somewhere, and then start debugging it, and you will immediately see what happens with this program, which functions are called, and then you have offsets available. So to get the shell code, we write some code in C first to see what the compiler makes out of this code. As I told you, we want to open a file and write something to the file to demonstrate to the man who owns the machine that you can write to his machine. You can run code on his machine. So the obvious thing to do for a C programmer was to be call fopen. And if you compile this code and use a debugger to see what fopen actually does, you will see that it's just a wrapper for the open function. And open is in turn a wrapper for a system call. So that's the reason why nowadays programs are so slow, because you can't do anything directly. All you do is call wrappers that call wrappers, and so on. So what we want to do is we cannot call fopen because it is part of the system library and we don't want to depend on that. And we don't want to call open because it is part of the system library. So we can use a debugger and see what open actually does and what we will see is something like oh. Sorry. So This would be the assembler code that actually does the system call. What it does is the push some register on the stack. Normally, operating system use the registers to get their arguments to the system. And then they call the system. And this is one of the ways to call the system. And it's one of the good ways, because you don't have to know actually where this code rests that does what it should do. So this instruction is completely independent of where the code is that does the system call. Linux does it this way. So what you have to do to get the effect that you initially wanted is 
two assembler instructions, which is like something like five bytes. The open wrapper is something like 50 bytes. The F open wrapper has to initialize the file structure and is like 500 bytes. And the code that does directly what you wanted in the first place is like five bytes. That is why assembly programs written by people directly in assembly language are normally very uh, small and faster because you this is overhead you don't actually need. So it's more comfortable for the programmer to use these wrappers because you don't have to remember how your system implements the system call. But for shell code, you want to do this way. So you use the debugger to step into the functions you need, and then you will see this interrupt um, is used every time for system calls. So how is the system supposed to know that you want to open a file? The idea is to put in some register some code that is defined in some header file that tells the system what you actually want. So what you do is you put in this register you put what you want to do with the system and you of course you have to put these arguments like the name of the file you want to create you have to tell the system to. And this is normally done, this is a string that doesn't fit in one register. Registers are only integers. So you can put numbers in there or pointers to memory locations but not strings. So what you do is you put the offset, so the address of the string this would be an example string it's somewhere in memory and you know when you write the program you know the offset of this character, the address you put this address this is ended with a null zero byte to show the system that the string ends there but you don't see this normally as C programmer, but you know it if you do some string manipulation. But um, the Linux kernel is written in C2, as are most Linux and Unix and FreeBSD variants. So this is a convention that's normally used on other systems too. Even NT uses zero terminated strings. And so you put this address in a register and call this function call. And the system has to tell you if the function call succeeded or not. So what happens is that the register EAX contains a zero or an error code. And this is quite low level, so you don't actually want to do this because this will only work on Linux in the end. It's not portable. That's why we don't use code like this. Normally it's small, it's fast, it does what we want, but it's tedious to write and it's not portable in the end. But um, with the debugger you can get these magic incantations you need to tell the system to open a file and you will see that, for example, this offset can contain zero bytes too. So if you construct a code that opens a file and writes something to that file and closes the file and then exits the program, that you have lots of zeros in your code. And you get some other problems like this is how system calls work on NT. You call the system directly. Most people use the latest version of NT normally. So this offset is fixed because they all have the same operating system installed. Of course, the next service pack made might change this address. So that's why exploits sometimes work on this machine but not on the other one, which looks the same, but if you install MS Office, you know that it will overwrite half of your system. And these are some of the effects that might be not, benefic not beneficial in this case. So okay. um, we have lots of problems that are not obvious in the first place, like this call. Calls on Intel architecture are relative calls always. So this, this will be coded in few bytes in memory. The first one is the call instruction tells the CPU that you want to call something. But if you do two calls to the same address, you get two different strings because you don't encode the address, 
but you encode the difference between where you are right now and that address. So this is tricky because if you insert some code above, this difference might change so as to include one zero that wasn't there before. That's, that's the kind of trouble you have when you construct shellcode. And you don't have this on Linux, that's why we say you should use this method and try your stuff on Linux and then you can port it to NT later. Okay, just um, just a bottom line to the information we have now. Uh, the point is what we want to do in our code, yeah, this comes back, um, is we want to execute something and we have we need parameters for this and we need a, the function. And as we learned, um, different systems have a different kind of function handling. So we have the difference between Linux, for example, using the interrupt um, method and NT using the call method. But whatever method is used, you can uh, check it out using a debugger, for example. Just write a simple piece of C code and use the debugger, follow each step, and you will see what actually happens. Either oh. in NT case, for example, you will see the, the calls. It may be some uh, more compli complicated because the, the function you see will maybe call another function and this will be calling in a different function, but somewhere there is the essential function you, you maybe uh, want to use. Actually, you, um, I would recommend that you buy some book from the manufacturer of your CPU and read it end to end to get all the tiny details that make your life harder in the end if you don't know them. For example, this is protected mode, what 32-bit protected mode that's used nowadays, but in DOS, you use 16-bit code, and then there's another version of code that can actually call a fixed address, not only relative ones. But the programmer doesn't see all this. This is a detail of the CPU, and you see this if you get in a book about Intel instruction set from your favorite bookstore, or you get the NASM assembler which contains a manual that contains information about Intel instructions. But in the case uh, of the ISS exploit, we uh, actually did it the other way. We wrote a, a small piece of C code and followed, because we didn't know where NT has a low-level function for uh, writing a file. We had a, some C++ function in some library somewhere, but we wanted a actually low-level function, because this is most probably available on each NT um, uh, machine. So Actually, and we followed. Oh no. yeah. The first thing we have to do is apologize because this was done um, a few seconds before we started here because we we considered it a good thing to show you the initial code. So this was back translated from the later code. And of course, what we mean here in this place is we want to write HTML code. So this was actually not an underscore but another character. I forgot to translate that, but it's not so important. What you see here is the code that you get if you reverse engineer what your operating system wrappers do in the end. And these goofy constants like, these goofy constants that we push on the stack here, 0, 128, those are constants from the Win32 API that say you want to open the file in sharing mode, and you want to create it if it's not there and stuff like that. Well, you have to read it the, the opposite way. You see the call function, the first one, where the uh, where, where's, uh, open written on the right side. Um, this is the function call. And what we do uh, on top of it is we put the parameters on the stack. This is the way how NT uh, wants to see the, the, the parameters of the function. Other different uh, systems make it uh, differently, but in that case we just uh, well, uh, we don't know what the parameters mean, actually. No, we, we do know, but it's, uh, this is explained in the Win32 no. API. One thing you might have noticed is that we, the, the order in which we push those on the stack is contrary to the, the API definition. It's the other way around than what the parameters look to a C programmer. This is because of the NT calling convention that states that you have to put the arguments the wrong way on the stack. Um, this is documented in a manual somewhere or you just have to know stuff like that. You can see this if you read the, um, the code that your compiler creates and then you can guess stuff like that. Or this is documented in manuals about writing assembly language for Windows. 
Um, I know that there are not many manuals, almost none, that explain how to do assembly language on Windows, but a few, few of them are there, and you should try to get hold of one of them to help you while experimenting. So what we do is we push some constants on the stack, and then we call the operating system. And this offset, the static offset, is um, static on most NT systems. But if someone installs service pack 6 or win 2000 better, whatever, um, this offset will be something else. So if you, write, if you want to write really good shell code, we would add code that looks, tries to find this offset by looking at adjacent places and looking for the code. But as far as I know, no one actually did that because you are happy when it works on your system so that you can put a message to bug track and be famous. <laughs> so um, we have to open the file, as I said, and then we have to write something to the file. Then we have to close the file. Actually, closing the file is not that important, but on some systems, when you don't close a file, you aren't, cannot be sure that the data is actually written to the file. So we do it here because we want to be a good example for you. <laughs> should always close your files. And the last thing we do is tell NT to exit the current process. If we just wrote nothing there, the CPU would try to interpret the HTML code as instructions and would do something completely bullshit and then crash and burn. And you would probably see in the event log of the NT system that the IIS process crashed. And this looks like a bug, or maybe you could suspect that someone tried to break into your server, but it's something that's visible. Someone tried to write in shell code some, t some time ago that would actually, in the end, um, run a process that would run the one you just crashed a few seconds later, so that actually nothing happened except some outage for a few seconds on the system. But there's no documented shell code that actually does this, so th we leave this as exercise to the audience. Okay. Um, this code is is the assembly version of a fun uh, of a working piece of code which would create a file. Uh, if we make a if we assembly this, have the, the the binary form of it, we would recognize some things which are contrary to the requirements. For example, all those push zeros. So these are the obvious places. Yeah, this, this is, is something we understand first. because this is the straightforward. This is assembly straightforward to create a file on NT. And obviously if you push a zero, you get zeros in your code, so you don't want that. A binary zero in your shell code. Though that would mean we cannot put it into our um, URL. The oh, one thing, yeah. one other thing. Um, you see here that we push the offset of string or the offset of message. But I told you before, we don't know actually the position of our code. So um, one thing that should be conceptually clear now is that we have to find a way to know where we are now. And as I told you, all calls are relative on Intel. So what you would do in this case if you call a procedure, I told you the current position after the call is put on the stack. So what you would do is this code. We just call the position right after the call, which puts the offset of this piece of code on the stack. And then we get it back with pop. So this is obvious code how to get the current offset, but as I told you, this call puts this offset on the stack, and this location will be encoded as the difference, and the difference is zero, so we have another zero which is less obvious. But this is the kind of problem that you will encounter when you write shell code all the time, so you might as well uh, keep this in mind now. Uh, and you can also see in the first message line you see there, um, there are some strings and you see those um, www code blau um, where there are not dots in the first place, there should be some dots there. 
but they are not allowed in the uh, if you want to have a successful uh, shell code there they, they are not allowed so why are these not allowed because we exploit the file name part of um, a file name .htr that means HTTP requests look like this this request will return will, will work like this you connect to foo the machine foo port 80 and then you say and some other crap so what happens is um, this part has to be our buffer because the extension is counted from the first dot this is some IIS specifics of course this is something that does not happen with all um, overflow exploits but this is something that has to be done for each thing each buffer you want to overflow and to be honest we didn't realize it at first because what you do is just write code and put it in the buffer and then you see it doesn't work doesn't even trigger the 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 code overflow because what IIS does if you say if you have a dot in here then the first the first characters after the first dot will be the extension and this will probably not be dot HTR so you have to avoid periods in the shell code too and periods can of course happen not only in the binary code from assembled instructions but again in offsets so one obvious thing if you want to get zero on the stack like push zero we pretend that we have only four digits in each number now because I'm tired of writing all this so this is an obvious way to get zero in EIX and then we simply push it this code is equivalent to the original push zero but it doesn't contain any zeros so these are the kind of things we will do to the code to get rid of zeros and not only zeros but end of line is prohibited two dots as I said and we noted a few other things we will explain later yeah, you have to start to apply a few tricks on your. But code. these are not conceptual hurdles. No, this the, is the, the working code is, is you can see it there. But you now you have to start to ha make some reps to avoid zeros, to avoid dots, and all the stuff. And this can be quite time uh, consuming because you have to test it all always. So in, in case we intimidate you and you think we are wizards, it took us a few hours to convert this code yeah. into form that does not contain any zeros and something no like 200 uh, tries to yes so um the problem is that it's easy to shoot yourself in the food on the way because if you do some something to change your code and you um before that code you, that you just changed you calculated the the distance to some the message that is stored in the end of the code and you insert a byte here you might accidentally create a zero or a line end or dot just in the offset the difference so um, even if you the transformation you just did was right you might as well um, put in another zero and it, this is quite difficult to find because all the feedback you get is that the server process crashed but didn't write the file so this is um, conceptually what you have to understand is only how to get this code that's on the screen now the rest is just fiddling with the bits to get the zeros out. Okay. Okay. And the, the hard work and 200 tries of exploit um, is seen here. Actually, one thing that is very good for finding problems is just just a, just a second. Excuse me. Just um, to make this one clear, this is the. Um, conceptually th exactly the same code as before it's a bit longer because all of the tricks we used but it's it's the same code makes the same thing 
So the first thing that you see is the commented out in three. This is another thing of the Intel architecture because this is historically the debugger interrupt. So if a debugger wants to insert a breakpoint, it used to write in three there. And the Intel processor has a special instruction so that in three is can be encoded in just one byte for this purpose. Nowadays, you don't do that because you have hardware breakpoints with special registers, but debuggers still listen to interrupt three. So if you have code that starts with in three, the debugger will open up, will pop up once you do the exploit. This is quite funny, actually, because you have to imagine me sitting on my NT server box and Edge triggers something on my machine. I haven't touched anything, and the debugger just pops up because he uploaded some code to my machine. I put this code in binary form, upload it, and because of the in three, he can follow with the debugger, which suddenly pops up, what is going on. And it, maybe there's some missing zero we produced after the last trick, and so on. And this is going over 200 times, taking uh, something like five minutes each round. So um, as I told you, we have the problem with this call that it is zero the most obvious thing to do would be to insert one instruction here. And it's not no longer zero, but this knob instruction means do nothing, and it's two bytes long. That mean, no, it can be encoded as one byte. That's what most assemblers do. So what happens, the offset would be one, but call uses a four byte offset. So what we actually have is not one, but So we haven't gained anything. One trick is that negative numbers are stored as lots of zeros. So what we do is we jump to temp2, which is two lines below that, jump back, and then call. So then the offset of the call will be negative, and we get the same result. So this is, this is the kind of code that you will see in shell codes. It's not obvious what it does, but once you know the tricks, it's all the same all the time. Make a jump there, and then you can, uh, we can make a, a picture. Uh, how does it work? Okay, we have a, we are somewhere in the code, and um, the forward means um, that direction, and we jump just one back, so we have an offset here, which is given a negative form, and this is just the FFFF starting, so in, in binary form. So we did the same, the same call to get it, but we had to insert some garbage that really makes the code hard to read in the end, and it more than doubles the code size. Um, so now we have the offset. The next thing is that, as I told you, the differences between uh, the relative differences, the um, between the code and the messages, for example, the file name will be a small number because the shell code is small. So we have we'll, we'll have lots of initial zeros again. Um, one trick to avoid that is that we use a number like this and add it to the the offset we just calculated. And when we use the number, we just subtract the same magic again. And in this way, we don't have zeros in the code, but we will have constants that contain no zeros. But this, of course, makes the code very hard to read. So that's why, oh, I have to excuse the comments that are in German, of course, <laughs> but um, they're not so important. We will tell you now. The next thing is um, we push zero. I told you how we do it. The first thing we do is. Yeah. So now you can see my pointer. Okay, so what we do here is 
Of course, we can't just put a zero in the register we want to zero, so we subtract it from itself, or another way that is found commonly in Intel code is to saw it to itself. This is done not only in shell code to zero a number, but on other occasions too, because the code This code is encoded in two bytes, and the move code needs at least four bytes for the zero constant. So this is actually commonly found even in compilers generate code that subtract a number from itself to get zero. So um, most people who have written assembly language code before know this trick. So what we do here is um, we add this magic to the constant. In hindsight, it would have been better to use something else than one because there's quite a chance that um, the constant will contain zero again. Um, this is the reason why there is a two, because it happened. It we happened to us. One, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. But then some constant has changed, and the addition of those produced an another zero at that position. So we change it to two. Yeah. So we had to. We, we experienced quite some pain putting this code together. Um, the next thing we have to do is um, we have to strip the dots from the messages. So the file name can't contain a dot, and the message we want to put in the file can contain a dot. So we put an exclamation mark or some other thing there. Doesn't really matter. Anyway, and. No, warte mal. Ja, ich dachte, ich könnte es beides zeigen, aber es geht nicht. So what we do here is um, that we have to patch up the messages. In memory, the message does contain not a dot, but some exclamation mark. And then we add code that overrides this with what we ha want to have in the place in the first place, but couldn't put there because the exploit wouldn't work then. Um, now we just simply do the same. We, we have state in here that's sometimes not obvious. In this line, we put the zero in EDI register, then we put the same zero in EBX. Now we push EBX to get zero on the stack. Next thing we have to do is we want to push 128, but 128 contains lots of zeros too. So um, we do some arithmetic here. This is a way, this is again um, using tricky code. You. And this looks like the one would actually be encoded with four bytes again, but uh, it isn't for historical reasons. So adding something to a register like this does not insert a zero in the code. This is something you don't really know, but you can see it by looking at the disassembly and looking at the bytes in the code. So this is actually a valid way to um, get rid of the zero. We incremented by one now. ECX is one, and we shifted left to seven times, and then we get this number. So what we calculated it, and the, the way we calculated it didn't introduce any zeros. There are some opcodes that you can't use because the opcodes contain zeros. Some of them are add, some forms of the add instruction. So sometimes if you want to add, you actually subtract a constant that you use. As it's really, really tricky to read in the end, but it's not so difficult once you get the point. Next thing we want to do is we want to push this crappy constant, which is some brand dead flag from one include file. And we have to calculate it again, of course. So <laughs> first we push this, the two, just get the two by by the same method we used here. Then we push the two zeros again. We didn't change EBX in the way. And now we have to get this, which is, of course, can be done the same way as here, just by shifting. And this number is small, but um, the opcode can only shift by, at, at most, 32, because the words are not bigger than that. So. Um, the opcode does not contain three leading zeros here because it would make sense to encode such large shifts. That's why this is simply a byte and shifting by 30 does not introduce a further zero. Um, now we have to get the offset of string. 
And initially what we did is calculated the, office, uh, the offset of temp3 and pushed it on the stack so we have it later. You can see all this by just using a debugger on this code, but um, those are the main tricks you use. The rest is just at some stage you get a zero in some calculated um, distance between the message and the code. So this is um, just the same tricks all over again. Okay. Um, well, I guess you get the feeling what is going on there. Um, we we have to use a few tricks to avoid all the, the conditions we had before. There are dots, there are zeros, and so on. Oh, there's but, one more important trick. But, yeah, well, um, this one. As I told you, the offset is static. The address where we want to go to is static, but we can't call it because that means we would have to encode the, the relative distance, which we don't know because we don't know where we are, so we have to calculate it. Or another way is to put the value in a register and then call that register. I don't know why this is there because you don't need it most of the time. Um, but this is a way to call a fixed offset. OK. So the first block you saw is um, exactly the same like in the previous file, where there were just pushes, push 0, push 0, push 128, and so on, and the last call of the uh, actual function which creates the file, and so on. And we go to the next function which writes, and the next fun function which closes, and you might expect that we are finished then, but no. Uh, the problem was that the ISS randomly changed our codes in memory. So what happened was... This is actually this not, not documented at all, yeah, in, in not a single manual. We don't so know we the reason, but what happened is you can take this um, assembly code, um, make it in binary form, and check whether the conditions, um, uh, whether you, you, you match the conditions there. Um, if, if there are no zeros, no dots, and so on, you're finished. Actually, we have a thing. theory. Yeah, we have we, we have a theory what happened because well, it we might just let be me finish. Just this, let me finish to to say um, what happened was we had a code, a binary code, fulfilling all the uh, requirements. But when uploading to the server, we could see in the um, debugger that some positions in the code were changed. Some uh, some bytes were um, some newly bytes were introduced randomly. Others were um, erased. That wasn't really randomly. You could, it was deterministic, but there was no them. rule we could guess. Yeah. And okay, the, theory, the theory we have is that NT stores the file name in Unicode and does some translation on it, but it's just a guess. We don't actually know. But stuff like that can happen, and you have no chance to find it unless you do the in 3 trick to get the debugger. Otherwise, you don't even know what happened to you. So if you, want to, if you really want to do shellcode on NT, what you have to do is get a decent debugger. There's no way around that. Yeah. So the next thing we did was that we guessed it wouldn't work if we had slashes here because if you have a slash here in the URL, um, you don't have an extension .htr which is used to trigger the event. And we wanted to write a slash to the file. So the, the text we want to write to the file um, was changed a little. So we replaced slashes with this brace and we replace dots with with um, this exclamation mark, and we exchanged spaces with this, and we found incrementally ISS was changing different bytes, and the exploit wouldn't even trigger, and then we just guessed and replaced another byte, and that's why the pattern con the we used to initially was just letters, because letters are rarely changed. Actually, we have never seen it, but um, opcodes can be anything like the German umlaut, ü, some other code above 80 hex, anything, and that might also be, um, um, be viewable as Unicode and then translated randomly. So um, you have to have a debugger and then you see that your code is changed and you look at the, the byte that was there before that was supposed to be there but isn't now and have to, to re engineer your code to not have that byte there, which is sometimes quite difficult um, because it was two instructions that triggered the byte. We found that it was not just one byte that could trigger the change, but the same byte was not touched above that. So it was really sequences of bytes that triggered these changes. 
This is probably unique to this exploit, but we tell it to you so you know if it happens to you, it happened to us too. The changes were the same, but they were not really understandable to us. So um, the problem is we now have a completely wrong string in memory. We have to write a small um, piece of code that loops through the code that was easier than calculating um, the offsets again and introducing more zeros maybe. So what we did was just write a small routine. So we wrote this small, small routine that would um, reverse the, the changes we had to do. So this is one of the changes. This is just small assembly code that jumps through the, the string, reads the byte, compares it to the um, new values we wrote instead. Um, of course, this code might have contained zeros or other prohibited characters again, so that's you see why it took us 200 iterations to get the right code in the end. So um, when we called the first function, we got the handle, the file handle back, which is an integer, um, and we stored it on the stack. So now what we have now is we have to use that value as argument to the next call, the right call, so that NT knows in which file we want to write. So what we do here is fix up the registers again. And as you can see, the, the 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 1 pattern didn't suffer in this position. So we added another 50, 50, 50, 50, and subtracted it again. Um, this knob was introduced because otherwise the last byte of this and the first byte of this triggered one of those Unicode conversions. So the code actually does not more than the code you saw initially, but it looks way more complicated. Next thing we do is we call the write function and we have to um, get the length of the message. Again, this length is because the message is so small, a number that contains three leading zeros. So what we did here is that we moved zero into E, CX, and this is some Intel idiosyncrasy that allows us to write the least significant byte. And because we know it's zero, we don't add it, but we all add, because I told you before, one instance of the add instruction has an initial zero byte as the opcode. So what we do here is or those, by those bits, and the result is, where was it? Here was it. The result is that we have actually string length of message in ECX and can push it. Now, the same thing we did before. Um, another, another thing, you can imagine pure desperation in us when we see the code looks correct, doesn't contain any zeros, but is still rewritten. As in this case, where this offset of the NT function actually contained one byte that would trigger one of those Unicode things, and we couldn't simply change it because this offset is static, you can change it. So what we did is we inserted one instruction that doesn't do anything. EAX is zero in this case, and soaring with zero doesn't do anything. But this instruction inserts two bytes and um, made that rewriting go away in this case. Again, the same thing. Of course, SOAR and OR are the same, but I said a little, um, little different code is more interesting. So this again does nothing, and um, but we have to get zero on the stack again. Um, we want the, the process to exit. And this is the last thing that this process does. Exit process never returns, so we can just put those numbers here. Imagine our surprise when we found out that these were rewritten with a single backslash. What IIS did in internally is convert the the slashes to backslashes because that is the path name conversion uh, convention under NT and MS-DOS. Um, so what it did was first convert our code to contain backslashes and then it um, fused more than one backslash into one. So not only did it change the code, but it changed, made the offsets wrong, which we calculated on the basis that two slashes here. Yeah, imagine you have 
the whole stuff in binary form, you find some strings there, and there are two slashes, which are converted to backslashes, two of them, and then stripped to one, just one. And then, but then we don't have a uh, valid URL anymore in the file we want to. Unfortunately, we don't have an NT server here for security reasons, obviously, so we can show you this code, but um, we are going to put it on the FTP server and then you can try it yourself. You will need nasm to encode this. Um, should work out of the box. Actually, this is just one part the, um, because we found a wrapper on the internet. Some guy had written in a generic exploit, so to speak, that would allow us to specify just the code that should be executed and get rid of the calculating the offsets, um, the size of the buffer, which bytes you have to actually override. So we had a convenient wrapper that would allow us to specify just the code that should be executed. But as you can see, it was still, we thought it would be a matter of a few minutes. <laughs> we were wrong. So this wrapper is, um, not trivial to write, but if you know the trick with the pattern that we showed you initially, it's not that Well, the difficult. wrapper only uh, opens a, a socket and writes this stuff together with the valid um, HTTP uh, protocol header to the IAS server. You need some, some way to say uh, the server, the, the, um, the code, yeah, to, to give it to you. Okay. So that's it. That's it. Thank you.